The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. So at this time, I'd like to present our first um, speaker, um, Megan Elliott. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, it's always hard to be the first speaker after lunch because that means you either have an audience that is totally engaged or promptly falls asleep. So I'm hoping for the former, though I won't be offended if I get the latter. Um, so how many, I'm just curious how many people here today came from the Twin Cities today? So we have, okay, quite a few people. And then um, I'm actually not from Minnesota, not from the Twin Cities, but I do think that History of Reinforced Concrete in the Twin Cities is a highly underrated area of scholarship. So hopefully you'll agree with me as well. Um, I'm going to start my story with, in 1857, with Orson Squire Fowler. So Mr. Fowler, first and foremost, was a phrenologist. And some of you may remember that phrenology is a pseudoscience focused on the brain, um, surmising that certain areas of the brain are dedicated to different functions. So he even edited the American Phrenological Journal from 1838 to 1842. But he also made his mark on American architecture when he published a book about the advantages of octagonal houses. Uh, his house was, or, I'm sorry, his book was called The Octagon House, A Home for All, A New, Cheap, Convenient, and Superior Mode of Building, printed in 1848. As a result of his popular book, a few thousand of these houses were built, primarily in the Midwest. And so Mr. Fowler was passionate about three things. Phrenology, octagons, and concrete. Um, his unique interdisciplinary obsession led to his third book, printed in 1853, which was called A Home for All, or The Gravel Wall in the Octagon Mode of Building. Clearly an enthusiast of concrete, however, he appears to have been mistaken that concrete had been around since the Romans because he attributed it to a Mr. Goodrich who lived in Janesville, Wisconsin. And he credited himself with developing and popularizing the technique. Um, but Fowler knew that gravel and lime were available in unlimited quantities here in the prairies and decided that it was a cheap, durable, and appropriate way for building here in the Twin Cities. So we did have the George F. Farrington House built in 1857, located in St. Paul. It's the only one built in St. Paul. It was built just three years after St. Paul was incorporated as a city, and one year before Minnesota was admitted to the Union in 1858, which means that the use of reinforced concrete precedes the state. Uh, the walls were built up a few feet at a time, pouring the mixture of gravel and lime into timber shuttering. The shuttering was then removed and raised and reused. Um, the oct octagonal design made wood framing, as would be the vernacular way of building, quite costly. So the walls of the house were constructed from the reinforced concrete, coated with plaster. The house was demolished in 1917, ironically, to make way for the Minnesota History Center. The St. Paul Pioneer Press wrote, quote, the home of Mr. Farrington's is an experiment of his own, to see if a good house cannot be built of concrete. This experiment is successful in the opinion of Mr. F and is worthy of the attention of those who intend to build, being much cheaper than either stone or brick, while it makes a solid and not unhandsome wall. Oddly enough, Fowler's interest in, let's call them octagonal storage vessels for people, preceded our next innovation in concrete, which was circular storage vessels for grain. So this is a, a local historic landmark located just outside of Minneapolis, actually in St. Louis Park, 
still standing, and some of you might recognize it by the Nordware sign that's painted on it today. This was the first reinforced concrete grain elevator, um, sponsored by Mr. Peavy, who was well known in the grain industry, and he had a desire for a fireproof grain elevator, because certainly the wood elevators at that time were prone to catching fire and therefore difficult and costly to insure. So this elevator was initially built to 68 feet tall, which is where that red line is shown. It truly was an experiment. It was filled with grain one time, emptied the following year. Later on, it was uh, added to be 125 feet tall, though by that point, Peavy was too busy with his grain elevators in Duluth. They never actually filled it with grain again. But it was this local experiment that made reinforced concrete grain bin construction possible. And this was a patent from Charles F. Haglin, um, local Minneapolitan concrete contractor. And it was actually this technology that allowed reinforced concrete to become the preferred method of grain bin construction, beating out wood, steel, tile, and brick. So like I said, Haglin, a local contractor, constructed the elevator using slip form construction. He had two concentric circles composed each of four pieces, and then the jacking bars in the middle would serve as the actual vertical reinforcement for the structure. A 1906 newspaper article titled The Concrete Tested in Fierce Blaze reported on a fire that destroyed an adjacent wood elevator, saying, quote, the terrific heat to which the concrete bins were subjected may be imagined when it is stated that the heat broke glass and windows of half a mile away across the bay from where the plant is located. Yet there's not the slightest sign of cracking in any part of the concrete walls, nor was the grain within the bins the least bit damaged. So clearly a success. So our second set of reinforced concrete grain bins in Minneapolis is the Washburn Crosby Elevator Number 1, 1908, also built by Haglin with the Haglin Star Company. So this time, now instead of just one bin, we have 15 bins. This is actually the particular set of elevators I'm talking about is on the far left, this set here. So we have the bins that rise to about 100 feet, and then the head house on top rises another 100 feet. Uh, this other set of bins was a bit later in construction. And then below the bins, the concrete extends 34 feet below grade. So certainly a massive concrete structure. Um, the bins are still here today, national landmark, part of the Mill City Museum. A recent stabilization project revealed that the vertical reinforcement was in fact those uh, jacking rods that were used to raise the slip forms, spaced anywhere from four feet to 10 feet on center. And then the horizontal reinforcement um, literally quarter-inch uh, rods were spaced anywhere from 12, 12 inches on center down to half an inch, somewhat randomly throughout the structure. So Haglin constructed many of our local prominent concrete landmarks. Um, some of you may know the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, which is now part of the Grain Exchange, the Metropolitan Bank Building, the Orpheum Theater, and the residences of George Peavy, Frank Peavy, Franklin Crosby, many other prominent citizens at that time, all wanting to live in concrete homes. Um, so Minneapolis was rapidly becoming a concrete Atlantis, and a concrete Atlantis was a term coined by Rainer Banham, an architectural historian, and he used this to describe this American industrial aesthetic that was becoming popular in our, our urban cities. He actually goes on to say and theorize that this industrial aesthetic influenced the international movement of architecture in Europe. So it was in this world where we had the industrial aesthetic and plenty of concrete that Claude Allen Porter Turner, one of our more famous local engineers, was working, otherwise known as Cap Turner. So Cap Turner came to Minneapolis in 1897 with the American Bridge Company, and he started his own business in 1901, calling himself a designer, an engineer, and a contractor for, for concrete work. So Turner was an engineer, he was an entrepreneur, he was a writer, he was a critic, he was a professional leader, and he always had a colorful personality. So Turner is commonly but debatedly credited with, credited with the reinforced concrete flat slab. And as I said, Turner was a writer. And he very quickly broke reinforced concrete down into four types. In the upper left-hand corner, he's showing what he called type one. And type one is a one-way slab, beams, girders, columns, and he said that this was really just an imitation of wood construction. And quite frankly, it was inappropriate for concrete. In the lower left corner, he had type two. 
This is a one-way slab spanning the simply supported beams. And he said this was still unacceptable because you weren't taking advantage of the monolithic properties available in concrete. Type three in the upper right-hand corner, well, this was okay. In fact, Turner actually built a couple of buildings of this type, and this is a two-way slab spanning to beams and to columns. But the preferred, the best, and really the only way anyone should build out of concrete was the system that he patented, which is the mushroom flat slab shown in the lower right-hand corner. And he wrote, in general, any type of independent beam construction is totally unsuited for a building of any considerable height. It lacks the monolithic features of true reinforced concrete. So this is Turner's Type 3 system. This is the uh, Northwestern Knitting Company factory, building number four. It was built in 1904. It was our first reinforced concrete building in Minneapolis. It was also home of the Munzing Plated Underwear, another local landmark, I might say. Um, some of the more interesting features of this building, what made it so innovative at its time, Turner had designed these reinforcing frames for columns that were built and then dropped into the formwork, saving time. Um, he used mesh reinforcements for shear. He had a two-way slab for continuous beams, and all of his buildings were load tested. So this one was load tested to 900 pounds per square foot. But Turner's big claim to fame was his mushroom system. And if you're not familiar with his mushroom system, this is what he called the type four system. What it is, it's a four-way reinforced slab and what makes it distinctive, of course, is the pattern of reinforcing, and then it's also recognizable by those flared column capitals. And there are several theories for why this was called the mushroom system. One, of course, was the pattern of reinforcement around the column head, which can look a little bit like a mushroom. But perhaps the better one is named for the speed at which it popped up all over the country. Um, Turner, as I said, was an entrepreneur and a salesman, and he really pushed the advantage of this system. So in this diagram, this is a diagram from his book showing the mushroom system on the right, conventional building on the left, uh, and he pushed the advantages of this system. So minimal formwork, reduced floor framing depth, simplified lighting and finishing, high capacity, great for warehouses, great for wholesaling, great for manufacturing, more efficient use of materials, better for fire suppression. So this all sounds great. And what could possibly be wrong with Turner's designs? Well, the biggest disadvantage with Turner's mushroom system was its, call it, dubious analytical proof. It was a proprietary system, and Turner had conceptualized this as a slab that cantilevered over the columns. So in his mind, there was little to no stress at the center of the slab. And as it turns out, what we think was happening was that he was building test slabs and then loading them, and then back calculating the bending and deflection coefficients. Um, this is one of his better yet never built uh, mushroom system dams, which I think is quite cleverly a warehouse in the water. Um, another local uh, personality we had, Julius Kahn of Detroit, not here in Minneapolis, but certainly his system got a lot of use here. Turner didn't like the Kahn system. So he wrote, um, and this is a, a system where you're, he's bending up the bars and, and conceptualizing concrete to act as a truss. So the bars are in tension, the concrete is in compression. And Turner wrote that the proof of this system reminded him of a friendly discussion between two lawyers, in which the case came up as to who was recognized as the most prominent attorney in the place. I am, of course, said the first. How can you prove it, asked his friend. Why, I do not need to prove it. I'm willing to admit it, replied the first. So the other person that was um, offered a theory in reinforcement this time was Ransom. He may be the very biggest name in reinforced concrete at this time in the U.S. He came from England, uh, started his career in San Francisco, and was probably most well known for his twisted, cold, uh, square bars. Um, and Turner and Ransom had very different ideas on how reinforcement acted with concrete. Ransom thought it was important for the bars to be deformed and otherwise have some adhesion with the concrete, and he proved this through testing. Turner was quite certain that it was important for the bars to be able to slip within the concrete. So he felt that the concrete had to shrink and grab the bar, so all of his bars were round and smooth. So it seems somewhat coincidental 
that by the time the ransom bar broke into the Twin Cities, this is the same time when Turner's getting involved in lawsuits. And this is the Dear Weber edition, which was really the start of the downfall of Turner's career. Um, so the Dear Weber edition was built in 1910. It's in Turner's backyard. And anyone working in Minneapolis knows that if you're going to build a concrete building in Minneapolis, you're going to ask Turner how to do it. However, the C.M. Leonard Company of Chicago built the building. Not only did they build the building, but they filed a lawsuit for patent infringement because they owned the Norcross patent to an employee. If you know anything about the Norcross patent, it's quite different than Turner's system. But, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, they filed the suit. Turner filed a countersuit. Turner ultimately lost lost the rights to his uh, design, and that was basically the start of the downfall of his career. So perhaps it was Turner's prominence in Minneapolis, or maybe he was originally selected as the engineer of record, but the Plymouth building in Minneapolis was mistakenly attributed to Turner. In this building, at the time of its construction, was touted as the world's largest all-reinforced concrete office building in the world. And it's important precisely because it's not a Turner building. So the Plymouth Building, in my mind, exemplifies the mature development of the reinforced concrete skeleton frame. And I know that if you ask someone, where is the first reinforced concrete skyscraper? They're going to tell you Cincinnati. And they're going to talk about the Ingalls Building. But actually, I think Minneapolis can make an argument to the contrary. So what's different about the Plymouth Building? Well, the Ingalls Building, if you know it well, it had concrete walls. And it was theorized, if you read the writings of the early engineer, it was theorized as a concrete box. So they're very much thinking about those concrete walls as being integral to its design and stability. The Plymouth building, on the other hand, was a concrete frame. And it had an exterior spandrel beam on which the masonry curtain wall was placed. Uh, which was very different from what Turner was doing, because Turner was still relying on the exterior lateral walls for stability but this building was relying purely on the concrete frame. So at the time it was constructed, this building was constructed to the maximum height allowed in Minneapolis, which was 12 stories. And the Minneapolis Morning Tribune reported that when news broke that this building was actually going to have a 13th story, a group of concerned citizens demanded an explanation. And the newspaper writes, quote, a general rush was made to the office of S.S. Thorpe, Mr. Andrus' son-in-law, the matter was put up to him in injured tones by the excited populace. Why, answered Mr. Andrews as he swept off his wide Panama hat to greet the delegation, that's only the roof. It will be used for storage and not for office room. However, they did rent that 13th floor's office space, and they continue to rent it today. Um, so this skeleton frame that I mentioned was proven not only in the original construction of the building, where the walls were built, not from the ground up, but somewhat randomly, the masonry was placed. But then again in 1936, when a substantial portion of the exterior was actually removed and replaced. So you can see on the left what the Plymouth building originally looked like, and then after the recladding in 1936. So an article in 1910 called The Romance of Ancient and Modern Concrete acknowledged both the novelty and utility of this design, and it said, the frame of the building is built separate and distinct from the outside shell. The frame, therefore, will be good for centuries and cannot be demolished except at fabulous expense. The outside, however, can be redressed time and again, just husked like corn every century or two and a new exterior added. So only in the Midwest do you talk about husking a building like corn, but they actually did it. Uh, and then in 1936, the newspaper article wrote, because it incorporated many designs and structural features in buildings of more recent construction, the modernizing of the building necessitates fewer changes than might otherwise be necessary. So they really were taking advantage of that skeleton frame. Um, if you haven't noticed, we do have cold weather here. And the other thing that the Plymouth Building did for Minneapolis was put us on the map in terms of cold weather concreting. So in 1916, the Portland Cement Association publishes a handbook about cold weather concreting. And they give you two options. You can add salt to the mix, which is actually what Ransom promoted, or you can just heat all the materials. So the Plymouth Building chose to heat all the materials, and there's actually stories um, from around the neighbors that were complaining about all the smoke coming from this building as it was constructed. 
but we have the construction logs that indicate that they were pouring concrete down to two degrees Fahrenheit for this building in 1910. So keeping pace with vertical construction, construction, we're going to move to our innovative horizontal construction in Minneapolis. William S. Hewitt and the Milan system of bridges. So William S. Hewitt was a major bridge contractor in Minneapolis from the 1890s to about the 20, mid 20th century. Um, so bridges built by Hewitt's firm were some of the earliest reinforced concrete bridges using the Malon system, which came from Joseph Malon, a Viennese engineer. This is a bridge that remains today. Um, it's graceful deterioration, shall we say, actually quite clearly shows the Malon system in the bridge. Uh, this building's closed to traffic now. So. Um, we do have several other surviving bridges that use this system including the Interlochen Bridge, another Como Park Bridge, and the Third Avenue Bridge. And so at this point, we're going to move to our Norwegian portion of the program and talk about all of the Norwegian engineers that we actually had working in Minneapolis. So the last major Malon Ribb-style bridge in Minneapolis crossing the Mississippi was the 2,223-foot-long multi-arch bridge designed by Minneapolis city engineer Frederick Kaplan. And this bridge was actually designed to have the arches leap over the planes of weakness in the limestone below. Originally, a steel bridge was proposed, and the city favored concrete, or chose concrete, saying that the concrete bridge proposed is not only desirable from the standpoint of beauty and ornamentation, but also from the standpoint of economy. In this, uh, so this Minneapolis city engineer, Frank Kaplan, one of several Norwegian-American bridge engineers in the Twin, city, Twin Cities, Norwegian-born, um, held the office of Minneapolis city engineer for many years, and this is the Kaplan Memorial Bridge. So as engineers, we often like to talk about the biggest, the best, the strongest, the longest bridge. And this is no exception. So when this bridge was built, this was the largest concrete arch in the world. Uh, this is the largest rainbow arch in Minnesota, the Robert Street Bridge in St. Paul. And back to Norwegians, we have the inner city Ford Parkway Bridge. So this was uh, Martin Sigvart Grutbeck, a Norwegian-American engineer. Our last Norwegian of the day, the 10th Avenue Bridge, designed by Christopher Olsen Ustad. And then coming back to Cap Turner, because no concrete talk can leave Cap Turner for very long, this is the Fort Snelling Mendota Bridge. And this bridge was the longest continuous arch bridge in the world when constructed. So Cap Turner, um, in Cap Turner's office was Walter Wheeler, and some of you may know Walter Wheeler for his patented smooth sealing system used in the Minneapolis Armory. So this was a system that would allow, uh, similar to Turner, he was dealing with the, the flat slab problem. So he referred to his patented system as grillages. A lot of times you'll hear people to referring to them as the Wheeler head. Um, so my only reinforced concrete riddle, uh, what do you get when you combine a successful bridge contractor with a foremost local architect and a researcher from the University of Minnesota? We get a water tower. So this is local architect Terry Wild Jones, William S. Hewitt, who we met earlier, who designed the Milan Bridges, and then University of Minnesota professor Franklin McMillan. So Hewitt had built a concrete water tank in Brainerd in 1919, and it leaked. And so he was trying to find a better way to do this. So he worked with uh, Franklin and McMillan to come up with a way of designing a pre-stressed concrete tank that didn't leak. Um, in this case, we have another Norwegian-American involved, and this is the sculptor John Daniels, who put up these Guardians of Health, um, saying that uh, the newspaper commented, romance is being put into the water business, the rather prosaic job of chasing microbes out of river water with chlorine and filters, which goes on daily in the filtration plants in northeast Minneapolis, is being portrayed in sculpture in the opposite corner of the city. And from water tanks, we're quickly going to jump to the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. So this iconic example of thin shell concrete construction in mid-century modern design. 300 foot long roof, two 120 foot long continuous spans, and 30 foot long cantilevers at each end, lightweight concrete slab less than six inches thick. Um, in my free time to make this talk, I did a brief Google search of patents in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. There were 174 patents before 1970 in reinforced concrete. 
Um, it's interesting to see Minneapolis leading the charge with the grain industry and Cap Turner early on, but it eventually evens out. Uh, coming into the 70s, post-tension flat plates, taking a cue from our earlier pre stretched concrete from William S. Hewitt. Um, this type of construction is typically used in residential construction, but certainly came into other forms as well. Uh, we have the 1968 Summit House East moving through the 1980s with the Hyatt Regency under construction here. And then that kicks us off into the 1980s with the Metrodome Stadium. And this building made its mark for its high strength concrete. Um, interesting to note that some of you know, some of you heard perhaps the roof collapse of this building. It actually collapsed five times over the course of its, over the course of its um, time. However, during none of those collapses can it be attributed to the high strength concrete. So I think we have a success. Um, so this brings us around to some of the research going on today. The race for higher concrete strength in the 1980s brings us to some of our current research in Minnesota dedicated to durability, and environmentally friendly concrete mixes, and perhaps some of what's the theme of today's conference.